Piety. Piety rejected the archdemon Dantrima's suggestion to run as far away from the impenetrable castle and the city of Athlea as possible. Instead, he carved out a shrine to the archdemon under the white dogwood forest that was still within the high weather mage's protection. He hoped the healing mages also protected the area. The priest wielded his newfound warlock abilities to carve tunnels and caverns, manipulating his curses and learning their limitations. With time, he refined the crude power. He understood how to control warping and eroding curses. If there were additional types, he would need to experiment further using a different medium. As far as he could tell, so long as he was causing destruction, his warlock abilities could work for him. It did not matter whether he ended up creating something from them or not. He couldn't demolish too much of his creations, otherwise he would need to restart. Kazair's tree roots were a challenge he hadn't faced when he crafted the demonist shrine in Sovain's soft, sandy soil. The gnarled nature of the roots contributed to the desired atmosphere, so piety left them when he could. As merchant caravan after merchant caravan arrived to trade their wares inside the impenetrable castle, piety lifted necessities from their carts, especially at night. Since escaping the impenetrable castle's dungeons, he had had no gem or coin on his person. He mostly lived off what he could find in the forest. Piety recognized it was foolish to live in such a manner, but his gut trusted the wood. Something extraordinary would happen here, and he wanted to be a part of it. Following the shrine, he created underground living quarters. When he recruited additional followers for Dantrema, they'd need a place to stay. He leveraged the archdemon's power within himself to cut out and warp the wood of trees into shapes of beds, doors, dressers, tables, chairs, a flat wooden floor, and other furniture inside the hideout. But only went so far, and he would need far more supplies, more than he could feasibly steal. After he had furnished the underground rooms and stockpiled extra tables and chairs, he waited for a trading caravan to pass through. He kept his newly crafted wares perched on the side of the merchant road. It would have been far more convenient to craft a cart and haul the pieces without having to wait, but he hadn't the time nor the expertise to care for working animals in his current setup. When a caravan spotted him, the first oxen cart came to a halt and signaled for the rest to do the same. Does your caravan have an open cart I could rent to move my wares inside the castle? Piety asked innocently. Depends, the leader said. What happened? I got into a bickering match with my previous cart driver. Something about my making love to his wife upset the man. Piety lied playfully. Can't imagine why. The leader glowered at him, but allowed Piety to rent an oxen cart. Due to the short distance, it would cost him a tail cut as soon as he sold a piece to repay the driver. Before the agreement finalized, several cart drivers inspected the quality of his creations. They were bewildered as to the method of his craftsmanship, but were all confident that the pieces would fetch high prices inside the castle's overpriced bazaar. Passing through the stone wall elevated Piety's anxiety. Am I being too audacious? But he reminded himself that unless Aether himself entered into the market, no one would likely recall his face. Once inside, the trading caravan secured a space among the vendors to sell to the city folk. By first sun high, Piety had a nobleman interested in his whole set. By second sun high, he pocketed the gems and settled his debt to the oxen cart driver. His earnings totaled a trillion cut, worth 4,000 metal coins. It was a small fortune earned from the work completed in the span of a few weeks. Piety considered going into the woodworking business full-time, but he had a grander goal to pursue. With the gem, he rehired the oxen cart to carry his purchased goods outside the castle and dump them back in the forest. He purchased ornate lanterns befitting a demon shrine and living quarters, and purchased metal hardware to install doors, multiple sets of silver diningware for a future kitchen, and blanket sets for all the current bedsteads and future ones. Even lugging all of Piety's wares, the oxen cart easily passed from the inside of the castle wall to the exterior path. The driver eyed Piety suspiciously, but assisted in removing the new pieces anyways. Don't mind my asking, but are you some sort of extroverted woodland nymph? 
I don't know any woodworkers who possess these skills, but you also look human despite your eccentricities. Piety re-examined his approach. He laughed off the man's joke. <laughs> no, but I have an aunt who is. The oxen cart driver looked him over warily again, but headed toward the castle as soon as Piety paid him for his efforts. Piety worked to integrate his wares into the hideout. Next on his list was to build carts that either a man or an ox could pull. He substituted metal axles with wooden ones, but because he was only traveling between the castle and the forest, it was so short a distance, he decided that the downgrade wouldn't matter much. After he had built the carts, a clearing formed where he had dismantled the trees. It looked peculiar in the densely populated woods, so in the clearing, he made additional dwellings that served as a front for what lay beneath the soil. He furnished those homes as well and created passageways to connect the empty houses to his underground tunnels. The next time he went to sell his wares, he crafted tables and chairs into a new style and sold them to multiple buyers. From there, he purchased seeds, planting soil, food stores, baskets, rugs, tapestries, raw materials, curtains, glass window panes, new sets of clothes, and additional metal tools, everything he might need for his project. As he left the city, a disheveled beggar pedaled on the side of a busy street corner. Piety wheeled his cart over to the homeless woman and sat amid her squalor of rags and compost. Tell me, who do you pray to? Asiel and Laylila, the woman said. And what have your prayers yielded? Nothing, that's for sure, she spat, nearly missing his shoe. Why don't you pray to someone who will listen? Someone who cares about their patrons and seeks justice in this world. The only justice in this world is for the wealthy like you. I've never met justice in my life. If you would like to, I am the person to speak with, he said. Huh? How's that? Piety smiled. Dantrema treats his subjects well, and he seeks justice for them. I'm a holy woman. Even if I am down on my luck, I would never pray for a curse. On the contrary, I have only experienced good fortune with his aid. I have learned the words of the incarcerators, and I have gained wealth due to the miracle of his curses. I don't see how that could be, she said. Wealth is bestowed upon those who work hard and earn their lot. If someone is wealthy, it's because they deserve it. What lies has this society taught you? A swindler can be just as prosperous as a philanthropist. Fortune is no measure of merit. Two phases of the lunar cycle passed, I was as impoverished as you are now. If you want to change your life, and never again worry where to find a meal, follow me from the city, Piety said. Dantrima protects those who pray to him. Can you say the same for Asiol or Lailula? This must be a test of faith, she said. If I reject you, I will rise to glory. As a proclamation of my faith, I reject you. Asiel and Laylila, bless me this day. I resist you and all your dastardly temptation. See for yourself if your life improves like this. I'm giving you an option. If you want to take it later, I will return. Heidi stood and returned to his cart. He hauled it to the wall, and the defensive mage permitted him to leave the castle, turning the slab of granite intangible for piety to exit through. Disappointed he hadn't convinced the woman, he needed to improve his tactics for the next follower he tried to recruit. His manufactured dwellings came along well. His bunker could hold thirty individuals, and his houses above the tunnels could hold a dozen families. The more the priest leveraged Dantrima's curses, the more prolific he became in wielding the power to cut up earth, rock, and wood. In half a turn of the suns, he could carve an entire bed. He seeded fields and tended to the sprouts of crops. Deep in the ground, he carved a well. He dug plumbing shafts around the hideout, both above and below ground, and crafted sentry towers in the trees and additional furniture for gems, but he could not manage everything by himself. During his next furniture run, Piety's primary goal was to search for another worshipper. Having someone to tend the crops would aid me immensely. To find someone who could make cloth, pottery, glass, or metal would bring the little village a spark of life to it. More than anything, Piety wished to preach, but he realized the importance of the initial setup. No one would want to live worse off than they had previously. They had to come to understand the benefits of what Dantrema had to offer. Piety was the vessel that would show them the way to the Archdemon's favor. Not long after Piety had found the first beggar, Piety found another. This one had been a man. His beard was long, scraggly, and white. 
Approaching him had been more difficult than merely sitting down. As Piety approached, the stranger stuck a bag toward him. Jem, he yelled. I have something better for you than that. What's your name, friend? Piety asked. The older man eyed him suspiciously. Page, he said. I made parchment in my previous life. What's your story, Page? How come parchment didn't work out? Piety cried. Not enough people buy books. They're so damn expensive to craft, but I couldn't make a living selling them any cheaper. Would you like to make books again? Piety asked. That's an unsustainable market. The High King's staff maintains the monopoly. I don't know any other trades, but it's better than being a scrounger. What would you give to lead a life of relative comfort? If I don't have to beg, anything, Page said. Would you be willing to learn a new craft? Piety asked. In a wing flap. Could you live in a community? I don't see why not. Would you change your spiritual allegiance? My allegiance is as much for sale as my body is. I'm a few days away from selling myself into slavery just to have a consistent meal. Could you follow a demon? The man didn't pause before he said, Did you not listen to me? I'll scrape Mao's shit out of his ass if it gets me a bite to eat. Piety extended a forearm to Paige. I have good news for you, Paige. Paige grasped the forearm, and the two pulled themselves up against each other's weight. Stumping his pack, Paige stood next to the cart. Taking up the controls of the cart, Piety eyed the man's garments and asked, Before we go, I want you to pick out new clothes that you'll want to bring with you. That argument, Paige selected layers that were the same high-quality fabrics that Piety wore. Piety wondered if Paige viewed this as a test of Piety's dedication to his word. Paige's intentions made no difference to Piety. He would prove himself to those who chose to follow his archdemon. Besides, he wanted to spoil his followers with the luxury they had never known. Once the cart arrived at the outer wall's gate, the defensive mage said, <laughs> You've made a friend, before turning the section of the castle wall intangible for them to pass through. Piety had assumed that enough people would have passed through the gates per day that the mage wouldn't recognize him after only a few trips to the market. He was surprised to have been wrong. On the cart ride back to the hideout, Piety explained the setup to Paige. He told him he would like Paige to do whatever it was that he wanted. If he wished to continue making parchment, then they would use it to write down the holy scriptures of Dantrima. If he wanted to pick up a new hobby, he could, but it should be for the benefit of the group in some manner or another. Overall, Piety would provide everything to Paige in exchange for a partial day's labor. Piety shared the words of the incarcerators with the man and made a display of his warlock abilities. Beyond that, he told him that Aether was a false archspawn and explained the merits of worshipping demons. Page doubted at first. Piety said, I was a priest before meeting Dentrema. Now I am a dark warlock and a priest. Can I become a warlock too? Page asked. Have patience. I will leave it to Dentrema to decide who receives his summoning spell next. I don't want the power to curse others, Page backtracked. We won't use the power to hurt anything other than the existing corrupt institutions. When you inflict pain on the innocent, it only leads to the rise of new beasts to fight. Who do you consider corrupt? Page asked. The state religion needs an overhaul, but the way we do that is to change the hearts of our followers, not through violence. We need to unseat Aether and the High King, who uses the fake arc spawn as a political gambit. The two arrived at the hideout, and at face value, Page seemed moderately impressed. Who is the Arxmon, then? Page asked, opening the door to one of the homes and examining the dwelling space. Piety lingered at the door. I do not know, but I am confident he will emerge soon. It's been sixteen rotations already, and he hasn't revealed himself. Page sat on one of the beds and rubbed his hands over the blankets. I'm confident the knowledge will come to light soon. Do you have a plan? Page traced a few fingers over the warped yet functional craftsmanship of the furniture. Parts of a plan. Piety finally entered the home. I'm still working out how to execute it best. For now, the plan is to fill the hideout with followers. He moved a rug and revealed a trapdoor that led to a staircase. Perking out out of curiosity, Page initially strode toward the aperture, but then waited for Piety to lead the way down into the tunnels. If you can give magic to someone without requiring them to learn an impossible language and spend a fortune, you'll have half the realm behind you just for that, Page said. Even if they have to turn to demon worship, 
Piety asked, as he led the way to the shrine. Mm, perhaps a quarter of the population, Paige said. Interesting decorations you have here, he motioned to the hanging lanterns and the black candles inside. Feel free to change them if you like, Piety said, continuing down the tunnel to the shrine. Paige followed, clearly intimidated in the low lighting. How'd you learn how to summon Dantrema? Paige asked. I've been a demon worshipper in secret for a long time, even when I was still a reputable priest. But Dantrema gave me his summoning spell in a dream. He showed me his appreciation for my prayers. When I tried the ceremony, it succeeded. Then three of my followers and Sylvain followed me, and they too wield the abilities of dark warlocks. Together, we could create forces of nature you wouldn't believe. Why three others? We had only found and slain one of the legendary birds. A noble Strix has four eyes, one for each sacrificial ceremony. Otherwise, they'd all have become warlocks. Ah, that makes sense. Why'd you leave them? Paige asked. We needed to spread Dantrima's teachings across the realm. Also, as a show of faith, I purposely got myself captured by the High King. When I leveraged the words of the Incarcerator, Dantrima saved me from execution and walked me out of the dungeons. Execution? Eh, I'm not surprised. But it's not much of a show of faith if you could easily have saved yourself, Paige said. I wouldn't have otherwise, Piety said honestly. Paige watched Piety as though he couldn't tell if he were too foolish or too faithful for his own good. When they entered the shrine, Dantrima himself stood before the lavish altar. Is this your new project, then? Is this how you spend my power? Dantrima asked impatiently. Piety would never become accustomed to the sound. Immediately, he bowed to the archdemon, and Paige groveled on his knees. The scoured leather wings daunted Piety still. Dantrima's long, twisted horns scraped the top of the cavern, and Piety thought to carve out additional space for him in the future. This will become the hub of the angel's downfall, Piety vowed. Good luck with that. I don't see how you'll convince the populace differently when their mortal and immortal safety is on the line. Page, Piety said. You said you'd sell yourself into slavery for your next meal. Would others in your position make equally brash decisions? Page's eyes flickered between Dantrima and Piety. Shakily, he found his voice. I know plenty who would barter an empty stomach for a new spiritual allegiance. I would not underestimate the suffering of the living. Dantrima's eyes blaze. You know nothing of suffering. Page flinched away from the terrifying scene. We'll change the narrative to provide you your proper dues, Piety said. If you succeed, I'll build you a shrine and pray at it, Dantrima sneered before slipping through the underground wall. They're real, Page whispered, shaking after the archdemon left. Welcome to demonism, my friend. The next time Piety sold his furnishings, he brought Page along to sell their excess harvest. While strolling through the streets of the bazaar, Piety and Paige encountered the homeless beggar woman that Piety had initially extended his offer to. She sneered at Piety, but dropped her mouth when she saw Paige traveling with him. Paige, how could you turn to blasphemy? She demanded. Praying to Dantrema serves me better than praying to Losihay ever did, he replied. I can have whatever I want now. I can grow whatever food I want to eat from today's profits. We'll purchase animal hides so I can make books again. We'll amass a library and keep it in the building near the kitchens. She was the image of absolute outrage. Fair lady, we'd love for you to join us, Piety offered. I will not fall into your treacherous temptations. I will rise to prosperity through my faith, she said. The two demon worshippers proceeded to the market. Over the course of a turn of the moons, Piety and Page amass a following from the outcast and downtrodden of their society. With the addition of new faces increased the chance for theft and betrayal, but on the occasions that Dan Trema showed himself, the new followers fell in line. The improved quality of life put everyone in good spirits, and with the creation of a standard routine, it became easier for others to assimilate and find their niche. Underutilized professions were suddenly valued. They had everything. Farmers, artisans, engineers, bards, jesters... Chefs, scribes, retired soldiers, and more. Some slaves had even run from their owners at the whisper of the hope that the group had brought. The only gem that passed between hands were at the markets inside Athlia. 
Otherwise, everything was made, eaten, and used as needed. When whole families arrived, the children learned some of every profession, so that someday they could later choose to master whatever they liked best. Even with the specializations, the jobs rotated. At times, Piety busied himself with making furniture. From time to time, he would work tunnel creation to refine his skills and expand their domain. He spent the rest of his time leading ceremonies dedicated to Dan Trema or one of his arc siblings. Others had taken up the responsibility of traveling into Athlia to sell their excess goods and purchase what they could not make themselves. Occasionally, they returned with additional followers, but after big surges, the migrating numbers quieted down. Piety hadn't realized how many desperate people had lived in the realm's capital city, but perhaps he shouldn't have been surprised. It wasn't anywhere close to a quarter of the population, but it was more than Piety had envisioned. In total, he had gathered roughly 300 demon worshippers. The number pleased him, and his current objective was satisfied. However, with so many, his next goal became pressing. Piety would have to prevent the group from being discovered. <laughs> 